destiny. The elder said, I hope you find what you're looking for. Find a girl settled down. No, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited for the invitation um, and have a little conversation with you. Yeah, indeed. Let's get right into it, right? Because I heard some news about them trying to say you can't leave out of Jonesboro and come kick it with us. What they talking about? Yeah. Black family in politics, you know, um, as a black elected official, particularly a female, I'm the first African-American mayor for the city of Jonesboro. And you would think in 2024 it'd be some shifting that, um, you know, you might not be happy about being in this seat, but you'd be accepting of it once I got there. But just a number of the tactics they use and trying to just curtail me. And so yeah. they wanted to create a new ordinance. So if I left the city limits of Jonesboro, which is about three square miles for more than 24 hours, you know, which could be in the city of Atlanta or something, or he's still in Clayton County. I was supposed to notify the police chief, the city manager, and the council, and let them know where I'm going. Wow, really? Or are they going to provide, like, some secret service well, support? I, I, I don't or know, I, mean, I don't know. I mean, it, it's but, hot. when people, like, sit in the audience and listen, and I regurgitate, you know, I, I say, repeat what they're trying to do. They don't hear the laughter in the audience. Um, but, yeah, so this is kind of like the modern-day slave code that they're using. Yeah, so let's explain. Hold on. Get into it for those who don't know modern-day slave code. Like, what, what is this right here, the slave code? Because like, we're seeing it right now with you. Yeah, so I think um, it's so hard and so difficult for certain people to accept us being in these positions. So the only thing they can do is revert back to a level of control. Yeah. Um, and so they've been able to use legislation throughout history to control blacks, to control women, um, to control a lot of marginalized communities, um, Hispanic foreigners, um, lesbian, gay, the LBGTQ yeah. community. So it's, it's their way of putting a legal shackle to just say, you know, we just need to know where you are for no other reason. Yeah. But we just, because I can totally run that city um, within the city limits of Jonesboro, outside the city limits of Jonesboro. We're in 2024. Um, we ran governments remotely in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah, so, so this is not required. But indeed. again, it's just a level of control. Um, it's just not enough that I, I won the position. You know, now we still got to control. Yeah, I, I, I read something that Clayton County has the most black elected mayors. Well, so the number of things, you know, we're sitting in history um, all the way in Clayton County. We have yeah. the highest number of um, African-American female elected officials per capita in the United States. What? Say and that it, again. That's your camera. Y'all yeah, catch that the again. Hi, the highest percentage of African-American female elected officials per capita in the country. Which means when you look at the um, our land and you know the amount of land that we cover, we have more female black elected officials than right. anywhere else in the country. Can we so clap that up one time, y'all? Clap that up, clap that up, clap that up. Please, please. Yeah. Um, and also of the seven cities in Clayton County, five of them are ran by black female mayors. Wow. Yeah, and many of us are the first to either be the first female or the first black or the first black female in that position. How did you arrive there? What's that journey like? Um, so I was brought up around politics, not so much in politics. My father was retired military, so, you know, we were required to vote at yeah. 18. Like, don't ask for no allowance, don't ask for nothing. <laughs> Did yeah. you go vote? Yeah. Um, so I always knew the importance of voting. Yeah. Um, I can, um, so every chance I got a chance to vote, I would. I never thought I would be sitting in this position. In 2005, I bought my home in Jonesboro. Yeah. About two years later, for some reason, I'm not even sure, but I went to a council meeting. And now I live in a city that I know is at least 60 percent African-American. Yeah. But when I went to that council meeting, every elected official, all six council members and the mayor were white. <laughs> now, I'm not saying they did a bad job or anything right. like that, but I couldn't get past right. the fact that nobody up there looked like me. Right. Where was the rep representation? It, it was none. You know. Mm. And so at that point, I said, you know, I'm going to throw my hat, um, throw my name in the ring. And so I ran for a council in 2007. I lost by 48 votes. And at that time in 2000, I believe it was 2007, um, they were still voting by paper. Um, and what I've come to find out 10 years later, when I was fighting for, you know, that, you know, for voter suppression and voter, voter rights, I realized they had been hiding the election. You know, we weren't even coming out to vote in the election. You know, yeah. we had more people voting for the Jonesboro High School homecoming queen than we did for the mayor of the city of Jonesboro wow. because we just weren't aware. And I yeah. would never forget sitting in the room that night. My mother and I was about 50 people. Majority of them, except for my mother and I, were all white. And they were kind and very yeah. gracious as I lost. But I sat there in that room while they tabulated lost about the vote. 47 votes. 47 votes. So it could have been. But there wasn't a whole lot of folks coming out to vote. Remember, we didn't come out to vote. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So at that point, about 90 percent of the voters were white, even though we lived mm. in the city. That was 60 percent. And so when I got um, I just life happened. And in 2019, I decided to run again. I was victorious as council. Yeah. Glad but you I did. sat on the council as only the second black female. And I sat on the council in the city that's now 78% African-American, and I was the only black on the council. Wow. 
Yeah. Um, the mayor resigned, and I knew yeah. immediately. I sat two seats away from her when she gave her resignation, and she couldn't get it out her mouth fast enough before I had decided in my head, this is where I want to be. Mm. Yeah. I yeah. knew then yeah. that the opportunity would, would present itself, and it did. Yeah. And I ran, and I ran in November in a special election and won yeah. with a record number of voters. Yeah, indeed. Um, and then I ran again in November, and so now I'm sitting in my four-year seat. Congratulations. Yeah. I'm glad Thank you did you. that. How did you get people out to vote? Oh, God, it's like pulling teeth. I can't tell you. Yeah. Y'all, just stop making it so hard on us. Black folks, <laughs> go to the polls. Yeah. Um, yeah. I probably raised m 10 times more money than my opponent, mm. um, used every dime of it, knocked on more doors, spent more time in the field than my opponent, and still won by you know, a decent margin, but not as much as much as, 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 as hard as I worked. Right. You know, so you're, what you're having to do is for a lot of these voters, why we did have the great, the larger voter turnout, because I touched voters, it was important to me to touch voters that had never voted before. Yeah. Or voters that didn't realize it was important to vote in a municipal election for a mayor. But even those voters that aren't like super voters, they're low propensity voters, you got to touch them two or three times. You got to go yeah. by their house, say, hey, you remember me? You got to call them, be like, hey, you remember me? Yeah. You got to text them, did you go, did you go, did you go, did you go? So, you know, we had a field plan that touched voters three and four times, but it was very much, I mean, like, we had to be very clear and laser focused on how we were going to win this election. Mm. So we just executed an election that put boots on the ground. I'm grateful for a number of organizations that endorsed me and, and yeah. put their people to help me, yeah. but it wasn't an easy race. And yeah. then um, to do it twice in one year, you yeah. know, the number of resources, like I said, I wanted to become um, what I call political stamina that voters just realize I just got to vote. Yeah. And the hardest yeah. decision should be not if I'm going to go to the polls, but who I'm going to vote for when I go to the polls. Right. So I got two things, convincing you to vote for me yeah. and then convincing <laughs> you not go to the polls, yeah, yeah, you know. Exactly. So um, that's how we did it. And, right. you know, I would do it all over again. But yeah. I hope what I've done, not only did I, I created voters that cast their vote for me, but then now they realize the power of it. The power of it. And I need to continue to vote for yeah. every chance I yeah, get. So they'll, they'll see me again. Now, yeah. you, know, you get out here and vote for the, may um, for the mayor, but you also got some commissioners. You got a school board. Yeah. Yeah, yes, you got the governor and you got the president. But I'm hoping that um, not only was it a vote for me, but it was just a vote for our black family, yeah. so to speak, yeah. because they're going to continue to do it. Yeah, well done. Well done. So let me ask you this question. What mm -hmm. does systemic voter suppression look like oh, God, nowadays, yeah. like current day? It can come in any form or fashion, right. right? Like, so let me give you the example in the city of Jonesboro. In the city of Jonesboro, they would run the municipal elections separate from the county elections. And so what that meant was if it was a county election going on at the same time as the city election, if I was a resident, I would have to go two places. I would have to go here to vote for the city, and then in that same voting period, go, some, go to the county to vote. Mm. Now I'm begging you to come to one. Yeah, <laughs> now you want to go to two. And not only the ones you have to beg. So I have examples of, of Miss Georgia, Miss Virginia. You know, they, they have to get rides to the yeah. polls. You know, I yeah. got to wait till my cousin get off. I got to yeah. wait till my daughter gets off. I got to yeah. wait till my grandbaby gets off to take me. You know, and the, you know those kids. You know, they barely want to take her to one place, but yeah. now I got to convince her to take her to <laughs> two yeah, places. Exactly. That's two absentee yeah. and, we, and sometimes we at work and we just can't do. It. I'm exactly. At work. Um, another thing in the city of Jonesboro, our polling hours for early voting was from eight thirty to four thirty. So you can't mm. try to get it in before you go to work. <laughs> mm. And if you're getting off at 5, we're already closed. And how long? We had three weeks of early voting from 8.30 to 4.30. Wow. So that was for the first time I got elected, which is why it's important when you get the right people in office, because once I got elected, I could change all that. Yeah. So now the polls were open early from 7 to 7. Yeah. The council yeah. continued to vote to not to have the county run it, which yeah. um, cost us a lot more money. And it also inconvenienced our voters. But yeah. that's another reason why it's important that you go to the council meetings, because yeah. I had people come speak and talk about the importance of making voter ac voting yeah. accessible. Um, yeah. Go to these county meetings, y'all. Go to these council me council meetings. Go to your school public official meetings. school board meetings. If you got a child in school yeah. anywhere here. I don't care where they are in the country. Yeah. Go to a school board meeting. Yeah. yeah. Go to a school. Yeah, let's just start it simple. Go to a PTA. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got Miss PTA. Where, where, where Miss PTA at? There yeah. she go, Miss PTA. Go. Let's just get to the PTA <laughs> meeting first. Let's just start there. Yeah, yeah. then we'll move up. Yeah. Because it's sad now. A Christmas program and, and our children up there singing Jingle Bells, yeah. Jingle Bells, yeah. they're all going to be there. <laughs> but when it's time to, to sit and talk about the politics of school, when it's time to talk about ways that your children can, um, learn better or more efficiently or about yeah. academics, you're not showing up to that. Yeah. You're so not showing matter up to fact, let's stay there. What are your thoughts on the current education system throughout Georgia? We're, 
I know it's different Jones, different cities, but overall, what do you, what, what's, what's going on? So let me give you a caveat. Um, mm -hmm. I also was a school teacher for 17 years. Okay. My background is education. Perfect. I've been in the field of education for 25 years. Right. I also raised a child um, in a public school system. Okay. So this conversation is near to dear to my heart. And okay. really, when you talk about politics and black family, education is part of everything. You was telling me your series of things like, you know, fashion and black family. Yeah. yeah. Education is in yeah. every last one of those. You yep. can't separate it out. Um, I will put the onus and the burden back on us as parents, as aunts and as uncles. Yeah. You know, I ask parents all the, all the time, when's the last time you talked to your child's teacher personally? Yeah. Um, when's the last time you went to that school? Yeah. When's the last time you provided a donation or asked what they needed for that class? Right. Um, there is a lot wrong at the legislative level and at the state level that we need to correct, particularly for black and brown children. But we can't start to hold them accountable if we haven't started to hold ourselves accountable. Right. And I see it all the time. So I'm yeah. not blaming parents. I'm just saying, parents, let's just step up. Yeah. Um, what the teachers have to deal with in the classroom, um, politics don't touch it. If your child is bad <laughs> and is undisciplined or not coming yeah. in with their homework, it ain't a law in the state of Georgia that's going to fix yeah. that. Yeah. You know, you got to own your responsibility in that child's life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I look at what, you know, we put into our children as far as their hair and their clothes and their shoes and all things like that. But then I also ask, you know, what are you contributing to that school as yeah. well? You know, yeah. schools are underfunded. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of the resources need to come from parents and we got to be willing to add that extra additional layer. You know, you shipped my goddaughter's classroom. I asked the teacher, what do you need? And she said, you know, we just could really use some additional hand sanitizer. Hand sanitizer? Yeah, yeah the district's not providing cases of hand yeah. sanitizer. Should they, they there's funding there, right? There, yeah, there's yeah, funding there, there. There, there. There is funding there, but you know, you, sometimes you got to choose between hand sanitizer and a new computer-based program that'll help my child increase their math scores, you know, mm. their choices. It's like with any budget, what's priority? Mm. You know, um, a lot of our teachers were underpaid, so, mm. so a significant amount of funding had to go to make sure that we were compensating our teachers well. Yeah. Um, a lot of the buildings throughout Georgia, you know, they need to be um, upgraded, they need to be renovated, you know, there's right. changes and advancements in technology every day, it seems right. like. So we got to keep up with that. So it's with any budget, you have priorities, and sometimes hand sanitizer may not be yeah. on the top, <laughs> you know, but that's an easy lift for parents, yeah, you know, get yeah. your children some hand sanitizer. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes you'd be surprised when you get that, but um, <laughs> another thing, do you think teachers, okay, you said 17 years being an educator, do you think teachers are the same, have the same uh, integrity that they had when you were coming up versus no, no. now? No, no, um, I mean, something, I had, Something's happening yeah, here I had, with I had a kindergarten teacher that had been teaching for 27 years. My seventh grade teacher was about to retire. You know, yeah. when I was growing up, again, this is early 70s, dating myself a little bit, but yeah. <laughs> teachers stayed in the field. Yeah. You know, um, I never, and teachers had a level of respect with the parents. I remember yeah. coming, I'll never forget the story. I came home one time and it was in high school. And I couldn't wait to get home to tell my mama that Miss Dyson cursed at me. Yeah. I just knew my, my mom was like, she cursed at you. She, what she, I said, I told her what she said. She, she cursed at me in front of everybody. You know, the first thing my mama said, what the hell you do? Yeah. <laughs> she <laughs> exactly. like, I know she just cursed at you for no reason. <laughs> exactly. You know, right. it was, right. but now you don't have that atmosphere. You know, yeah. if a child comes home and says a teacher did something, that mother or father's yeah. on that Calling teacher, lawyers before they even talk to the, yeah, the teacher. I'm already know, calling a lawyer. And I'm not saying there's some teachers that aren't doing what they're supposed to do, but, you know, we don't have that same level of respect for the field and therefore for the people that are in the field. Yeah, how do you think, um, this is a, we're gonna go a little out there, but artificial intelligence and chat GPT and all of that plays a part. Yeah, I'm in worried education. about who's gonna be my doctor when I'm 80 years old. Yeah, me they too. Don't, they don't wrote everything me on too. AI. Me too, I'm, yeah. I mean, because I'm, 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 I'm looking up stuff on chat GPT and I'm saying. God, they're writing letters, they're writing essays, like, you know. I said, I said, let me, I said, scary. find out information on Daniel Sauter, Jonesboro Mayor, do 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 do, and I plugged in, and it was like, do, 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 do. I said, and ask me a couple, and write some questions too, right? And it was like, do, 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 do. and I was like, be more personable. And I'm watching it alter the information, and I'm saying to myself, I, at that point, actually, I stopped and told my son, I said, come here. I said, you see this? I said, this is called Chat GPT. I said, put something in and watch this. And he was so amazed. He was like, No, I show people because I'm just amazed. And you can put the yeah. same prompt in there and get 20 different versions. Yeah, exactly. Of it. So it's going to it's gonna get out of hand. What does education look like in that yeah. space? What so you, now what we have to do is spend money on how we modify and adjust our education to consider artificial intelligence. They, so they have artificial intelligence tutorial programs. Yeah. So those are great. Yeah. But then when you when a child has to go home and write a, um, a thesis or an essay on something, yeah. you can't distinguish between. Yeah. 
chat GPT yeah, yeah. and what that child likes to do. So like I said, when I'm 80 years old and my and my doctor's <laughs> going to be coming through this, I'm yeah, saying, yeah, y'all exactly. be trying to get a, AI yeah. for my diagnosis? I mean, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. So uh, They say that's the biggest thing it's going to affect. They say education and healthcare will be the two biggest industries that get affected first and then it will speed up every six months. And I, start, I said, what well, does that I feel, look like? So I feel like AI has a place to make services more efficient and hopefully in the end more cost effective. I feel like yeah. AI might be the solution to universal health care. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I feel like it's going to have its place. Yeah. But how are we going to make sure that AI doesn't interfere with the quality of education and the authenticity of education that our children are getting and that they're still learning? Yeah, indeed. And you can't tell indeed. me that. Yeah. You can, unless yeah. you got a parent at home that says, you know, let me see you with your pencil. So what's going to happen is when it's time to write essays in the classroom, put your computers up in your phone up and get a piece of paper and a pencil, and children don't even know how to hold pencils yeah, exactly. or write in penmanship because they've been typing their whole yeah, life. Indeed, indeed. So, um, yeah. Yeah. No, because I, I see my cousin post something on Instagram, my younger cousin. I said, this nigga don't talk like that. That's chat GBT. Yeah. I mean, he using, I mean, it's too many commas. He got every, I said, no, your grammar is not that yeah, good, right? Yeah, I mean, he's using but like he very fooled a lot of people because they were, yeah, yeah, it, it, was, it was great, you know. But um, I guess moving forward from there, we got to talk about it because you are an elected official. So we got to get into this current election, yes. presidential election, right? We have... Biden versus Trump. We have people who say Biden's too old. We see black male voters moving towards Trump. We have a lot of conversation. What's happening here? What's your thought? What do you think? So I, I want to say this. Um, now that the Republican Party, and again, I'm going to try to say it's bipartisan as I can, the Republican <laughs> Party has their candidate. Yeah. It's Biden against a bunch of foolishness. It's yeah. Biden against a lack of integrity. It's Biden against... Uh, so. You know, you, you have to, it's, it, to me, it's, it's, no, it's no longer about party. You know, some things are, you know, Republican, Democratic, you know, and then, of course, there's some bipartisan things going on, too. But the possibility that Trump could get back in office is the scariest thing in modern day society. Yeah. It's, it, it shows What's us so scary about it? it was, what that there are enough people. 78 million. <laughs> that feel as though he is the best um, candidate to run. Yeah. The greatest country in the world. How did we get here? How did we, how did how did he? Um, we got here because one, we have created a generation of apathy, where now people are realizing, oh, my vote does count. Remember mm -hmm. all those years when we had to convince people your vote counts. Yeah. You, you know, your vote doesn't count. Your vote doesn't yeah. count. Who was the voter yeah. die and all? Yeah. So now they're like, ooh, crap. Now I understand the electoral vote. Yeah, I got something. You know, say, so, um, I think with this pandemic, it's shown that leadership and who we have in office dictates who gets and who doesn't get. Mm -hmm. um, who continues to be impoverished and who doesn't get impoverished, yeah. you know, who gets the resources. And yeah. that's why I tell everybody, it's like, well, you know, city government, county government. No, we had ARPA funding, too. Yeah. You know, our city, we still have some, but I'm still divvying out. Yeah. And it's at the mercy of the elected official to determine where those things go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think we got um, a, long, a long history or legacy of voter apathy that yeah. we're trying to fix yeah. and, and jump. And I also think we also got there because there is a moral base to our country that is continuously depleting. And because mm -hmm. you know, um, when you can put that type of can't person back in office with his level of support, I mean, it has to be really, really scary. And again, I mean, because the polls has got him. To keep to keep it in the middle, right? Yeah, so let's say, let's say so let's say this, right? Um, election comes. I'm gonna give you two scenarios. Trump wins. What does America look like? Um, so it looks like a mess. <laughs> and you're gonna say Trump loses. <laughs> it looks like a mess. Yeah. Um, if he wins, then. Because we, you know, we can't all just jump on a plane and leave or whatever. I am hopeful that the democracy. judicial system and democracy will prevail. Mm. Um, I'm hoping that whatever level of sensibility and rationalness that lurks in his inner dwelling will peek out. That's when we will really have to um, rely on the Senate and the House and the people that we have in there. Now go ask me the second one. <laughs> so Biden wins. Then we then I'm afraid. What are you afraid of? I'm afraid of the extremes that support him, that have made it very clear. The MAGA publicly. party. Yeah, that made it very clear. The MAGNA, all the other insurgent groups, I feel like that will be their um, 
free reign, you know. So right. I'm not as fearful for safety if Trump wins, surprisingly. Because mm, that's interesting. But if Biden wins, that's interesting. Then it's the first time lost. I heard it like that. But you have to think of it like this. Sometimes you don't worry about when the enemy wins. W worry about the retaliation when they lose. When they win, they're happy. You know, I don't feel as though I, I love our black people. I love our Democrats. Um, but we never would have been bold enough to storm the Capitol. Not in a million yeah, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's the level. You, know, <laughs> you we, can't get them to yeah. storm the corner but, store. They're they, they, they going to be like, who going down? I'm not going. I'm yeah. not even thinking about but that. Yeah, Ooh, yeah. I mean, yeah, we ain't marching no more. You see what yeah. I'm saying? You know? Yeah. But so when you think of it like that, you know, like, yeah. so my biggest concern is if Biden does win. Yeah. Let me ask you this, did. Has the Democratic Party overlooked black voters? And has the Republican Party embraced quote unquote black voters just for the sake of? Yeah, I, I feel like black, the good thing about us as black voters, we're a hot commodity. Very much so, I tell you that all the time. Yeah, because if we vote, there's a, there's a saying in, in the political world, we vote, we win. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, so if we can get us, I became the first black mayor for the city of Jonesboro because we voted. Indeed. You know, th why had there never been a black mayor? Yeah. Because we didn't vote. Yeah. So remember I told you we had record numbers? Yeah. Because I went and pulled them out, you know, yeah. because you didn't vote. We vote, we win. So yeah. our vote is probably the most valued voting, yeah. valued vote here. And if we just realize the leverage that we had in the system, even in a bipartisan system, yeah. It's no question. Yeah, you, know, you, you don't see all these voting campaigns um, going up for any other popular, like white yeah, female. Yeah, They're yeah. not going around here and saying, Karen, come on and vote. Karen, no, uh -uh. Yeah. <laughs> they want our votes. Yeah, but you know, but you do something special because unlike a lot of people, like I see you on your Instagram, you was driving, you, you had your camera, you was talking to the people, you even said, tell city council, this is my money, I ain't doing it, this is my driver, something happened to your car or something, mm -hmm. and somebody came in, you was very like, you was active, you was in front of the people, you were like, I, I watch you. And then sometimes, and this is, Republican or Democrat, right? Like, we don't see the elected officials until it's time to vote. Yeah. Right? So, of course, this is changing. That's why we're grateful for you to be here with us. And same thing with uh, Eric Bell just coming and really, like, informing us. How can politicians do more to activate the black community or be in front the, the black community, especially the low propensity voters, they, they need to know that you, tr they, want, they want to know that you're trustworthy, that they can trust you. Um, and you said it, you know, yeah. it wasn't hard for me to convince certain people to vote because they had already seen me in the community. Yeah. You know, they even say, saw me out there cutting grass, walking in the park, um, doing food drive. You know, I yeah. served um, even after I lost, yeah. you know. And so that's one thing I told my opponent. I said, you know, you don't stop serving now because you didn't lost. Yeah. I lost and I kept serving. Indeed. Yeah. So I just had to touch the people and inform the people of what I was doing. And it was there. So we got to stay connected in our communities beyond um election season yeah I got you and 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 we got to hold our all of our officials you know like yeah. yeah once you get in those seats we know where are you like yeah. you know and that's one thing you know not bragging or anything but I, I pride myself on in my city is that you'll see me in any capacity yeah yeah, yeah um, you'll, you'll see today yeah. I was walking around with a yellow vest on for our community service workers when people on probation and come do community service so that my, my um, staff was laughing, and I was like, "No, it doesn't worry about it." The next time we taking this, um, our community workers out, I'm gonna be right there with them. They'll never know I'm mayor. You yeah, know? indeed. Um, and I, I heard what she just said. I don't think y'all really heard what she just said. Repeat that again. What she do with the probation workers? They don't even say that again, please. So we got, I had them get vests, and we could identify, you know, who they were. And so we got yellow vests. So they came in today. I was all excited. It says community service work on the back. So I put my vest on, and um, one of my police officers, our lieutenant, um, was like, "I didn't even realize that was you, Mayor." I said, "Yeah." Next time the group come in, I'm going out with them. Yeah. It's my city. If I can't yeah. clean my city, I can't expect somebody else to come see it, whether they're on probation yeah. or they're getting paid to clean it. Yeah. It's my city, Indeed. you know. Indeed. So um, when I'm walking in the morning, I'm constantly picking up trash, talking to people, um, because that's important. You got to be approachable. For number of reasons, not just for your vote. Yeah, indeed. You know, so indeed. I was, there was somebody that I felt was approachable that got me to where I am now. Yeah. You know, I have a doctorate degree and people say, well, how'd you get your doctorate? Because one of my, uh, it was a black sister, she was teaching at Clark University. I mean, she was sharp. I'm never good. She came in, she was sharp to the text. She had a nice person, nice shoes. Everything you want to see in a black woman. Yeah. But she was approachable. Yeah, and she I fly act, too, y'all. I'm people, and I'm talking about got yeah. the whole finny. Yeah, whatever. Don't, don't, say that, don't say that. Don't say that. I'm yeah. spending their money. Oh, yeah, oh, but sorry. anyway, yeah. So, um, <laughs> so when I saw her, I just me and my girlfriend, the whole class, we couldn't even concentrate. I was just like, look, her hair tight. Her, and I, asked, but she was approachable, no matter what she had on. I asked. I said, hey, Dr. Sims, I think I want to get my PhD, and she told me. 
I said, mm. but I'm worried because I don't have such and such. She said, do this, this, and this. And six years later, I got a PhD. Mm. All because she was approachable. So what good would it be to, for me to be mayor, to be the first this, the first that, but if I see somebody can't stop and ask me, like, hey, how'd you get such and such? Yeah. And so um, that's, what, you know, that's my prayer all the time. You know, keep me humble and keep me approachable. Indeed, indeed, indeed. One more question, and we're going to take it to the live stream and to anybody around. Economic mobility in Jonesboro, what does that look like for young entrepreneurs? How do they get involved? How, where should they start? Is it a home there for them? Yeah, so let me just say this, y'all. Y'all start with y'all credit. Yeah. <laughs> so make sure it's right when you come into Jonesboro. <laughs> make sure that you are insured and bonded. There are a lot of people I would love to do business with, but they don't have the things or the minimum requirements to do business with a government entity. Mm -hmm. One of our first contracts that we get, we're in a beautiful new city center, yeah. um, and we had never given out any minority contracts. None of our contracts with minority. Never? None, no, none. So the first black female contract is the girl that um, provides the custodial services, our cleaning services. Mm. But I'm a big advocate. You know, we're giving like, you know, even the person, the company that built our business, I was, I mean, our big elaborate um, city center is beautiful. You got to come out there. Yeah. I was like, hey, you know, like what a percentage of minority subcontracts that they have. So if you want to do business in, in the city of Jones, we'll have your stuff together. Yeah. You got to be insured. You got to be, you might have your own landscaping company and cut people grass in the yard. But if you want to do business with so go ahead and become a um, small, get, go through the SBA, become small business certified, become a minority woman yeah. business certified. Have those things in place yeah. and I can do business with you. There are a lot yeah. of people I want to give a chance to, but they don't have that paperwork right. You yeah. know, we do look at credit. Get your, your paperwork business credit. right, y'all. Yeah. yeah, and then you can come to Jones, but I'd be more than happy to, but I am making sure that we have inclusive practices, practices yeah. that are yeah. equitable so that everyone has the opportunity to do business with the city of Jonesboro. Indeed, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing yeah, that. Thank you. Real quick, y'all, we're going to take some questions, and we're going to get it going. So anybody had, oh, Wanda, you had a good question earlier. What you said about Clayton County? Go ahead, bring it up. This is the time. Politics and Black County. County. She got yeah, here. the county. Auntie here now, so come on, speak. The, the, the police. What's your stance on that, Clayton? A lot of people always say, you don't go to Clayco. Um, well, you know, Clayco has some crime, so, you know, let me just yeah. say that, but we've done a good job to bring that down. If you, so people say, don't go to Clayco, it was because you're going to either get a ticket or you might get robbed, you yeah. know, so, <laughs> so I had to look at, you know, which part is important, you know, so there was a number of reasons why people was complaining yeah. about coming to Clayco. Yeah. yeah, if you go at 80 in a 60 mile per hour, I'm going to encourage them to give you a ticket, yeah. you know, yeah. unless it's an emergency. Yeah. Um, if you break into, yeah. a, like, yeah, you're going to get, yeah. you know, so I think we're doing a better job. Yeah. We're doing a better job than making sure that our officers, especially like in the city of Jonesboro, that they have everything they need to serve fairly yeah. and appropriately. And yeah. that goes not just with the physical garment, but making sure mentally we have mentally sound cops and that they're getting all the training that they need to handle yeah. the situation so they don't de-escalate. And, and, yeah. and, and I'm saying that jokingly, but every stop does not have to turn into a ticket. Indeed, yeah. indeed, indeed. Any questions online that you guys want to uh, ask? Where you at, Brent? Oh, MJ. Yes, sir. Okay, let me, uh, let's get Brent and then we'll go to MJ. Go ahead, Brent, you live. Hey, first of all, I want to say thanks for being here. Love that, you, that you're here, love having you. Um, I want to ask, so I think one of the main things that discourages black voters, especially young black voters, is that there's a lag time between when legislation is passed and you actually see the effects of that legislation. What are some of the things that maybe you are doing in your administration that you would like to see done on a federal level and have a very limited lag time that uh, can help people feel the effects of the legislation right away? So um, my colleague that was here before, Eric Bell, talked about a lot of the things that he was trying to present and how he said, you know, one of the cases, I can't remember the bill, but he said, it, you know, it won't get approved to next year. So what we have to do is be educated and informed on why some things just can't be hurried. And just like there are certain things that we want to get past and we want to done quickly, there are some things from the opposing party and we don't want those things to be passed. So there is a method to the madness of process. And so I think when we educate our voters as to the length of the process and why it's necessary, then I think they'll understand. But like to the average person, yeah, that takes a long time. Just go in there and sign off on the bill and bring the funding. But a yeah. lot of the choices that we make, one, we have to make sure the funding is there. We have to make sure we have the correct funding sources. And what I just mentioned too, we want to make sure things that are past are equitable, they're inclusive, um, they're not, um, but, you know, you have to go through all of that and that takes time. Yeah. And so you don't want laws rushed, yeah. you know. Yeah. You know, we see with the pandemic, certain things can get passed quickly because yeah. we had to in those dire situations. Yeah. But I think it's just a matter of educating that 
big change does not happen overnight. Indeed. Um, and that's why if you're consistent with your voting and we're consistently putting people in there, then we'll never see the lag because there's always something good pushing. on the forefront. You're pushing, pushing the next legislation yep. through. I got you. Thanks for that. Um, so those are platforms and you know people might leave office but platforms never leave so that's why even like I work with Working Families Party and other different organizations because those platforms that we fight for are continuous and so you will see people come off a bill or are no longer in office but the platform that they stood for is there so I associate with organizations that stand for platform unions are really good I also work with CASA they have a big um, platform for affordable housing so no yes. matter who um, is presenting a bill or who's in office that's pushing affordable housing, I know where the platform stands. Yeah. So let's just be more mindful of actually the issue, the platform, and the progress, and not necessarily the person that's pushing it, right. um, you know, once you get them elected. Good job. Thank you. Well done. Thank you for that, brother. We're going to go to MJ. MJ, you want to uh, chime in real quick? Oh, yeah. First and foremost, congratulations. Thank you. you. For all your success. Thank you. Um, I have a question about 501c3s, uh, workforce, uh, workforce empowerment primarily focused for the children. I heard that uh, the kids in Clayton County, not just Jonesboro, is kind of disruptive. Mm -hmm. And um, how do we, if I own a 501c3, how can we partner or get funding, get some uh, programs in for the kids, have, have them, instead of them roaming around in the streets, have them go into certain programs to help educate skill sets, things as such. Yeah. So I really appreciate, let me just say thank you. I really appreciate those thank that have that, um, 501 3C programs, um, our non profs, because a lot of what we want to do and serve, you know, we rely on the non profs to do that as well. A lot of the funding that he's really talking about, the workforce funding, that's federal funding and state funding. So that is some of the funding that doesn't come down to municipal governments. But what you can't, what we particularly do is we partner to make sure that we can bring those services um, within our community. Indeed. So, but there are plenty of grants. Like I get, get on one of those grant listservs, there is so much money out there. Now, writing a grant is not easy, I right. can tell you. GPT check. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, GPT check. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but I would get on those listservs, you know, there's a lot of federal funding talk. Like right now, our city, our city manager, big shout out to Mr. Hill, who's with me today. But um, One time for Mr. Hill, we see you, we see you. Yeah, but we're working, um, he's a mastermind of getting these earmarked funding from our um, federal, from our senators, yeah. you know, from Senator Warnock, Senator Ossoff, you know, they have funding for that. I just seen that. some funding came down for a green space in Atlanta that was crazy. Oh my it God, like yeah. So we just got to tap in and work together. So whereas, um, and so also I found out that our 5013 C's in Clayton County, we have collaborations. Yeah. So they have a 501C collaborative. So you can't be so selfish that it's all about your particular 501C3 because together our collective voice. And so now a lot of the grants, several um, 5013 C's are going in together to apply for a grant to get the funding. But uh, what does that mean, though? I that means we got to work together. Yeah, yeah, that means yeah. we got to get along. That means right. sometimes we got to lose some of ourselves yeah. um, for the better cause. But yeah. um, we do appreciate what our nonprofits do, and I do feel like it's important that we can get our students involved in work-based programs. Indeed. Um, Indeed. And speaking of that, my last initiative that um, I started, I'm super proud of, is um, the Mayor's Living Wage Initiative. Making sure that, so right now in the city of Jonesboro, no one is paid below $19 an hour. We had people mm. in public um, works making $15 an hour, which is still yeah. above the minimum wage, yeah. but it's not a living wage. Yeah. So you, you multiply 40 hours times 15, you can't do much. Yeah, exactly. So um, I'm thankful to my council that we did, we were able to come together yeah. in last council me meeting. Yeah. So knowing the city of Jonesboro, so I hope that Jonesboro had a habit of just following suit or you know behind everybody else. But no, this is the time that we set a standard. I see Jonesboro may being one of the most innovative cities well, I'm, I'm, I'm trying. I, 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 I'm see trying. I see it. I see. I see something special. There. I know how to we get, get there, there early, and I'm telling y'all, Jonesboro got something in the water down there, man. They doing something special. Yeah. One more question: How much time do I have? Okay, so one more question: How does it look? Because a lot of blame gets put on government, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not fair, right? Because private money plays a big part. 
private companies play a big part. What are healthy relationships between government and private companies? And if it was a private company coming into George, uh, Jonesboro, like, what's ideal? What is that? So I'll just give you one example. There are a number of ways. So a lot of times our residents say, you know, we want um, nice restaurants. You know, we want a nice restaurant. Well, most restaurants and most franchise, they look at your average mean family income and they determine, which is why you don't see Whole Foods in certain areas, which is why you don't see Star Targets Starbucks. in certain areas, you know, which is why you see it. I'm not, I'm not putting them down, but American Deli and nail shops in certain areas. So if there are a certain caliber of things that we want and we're asking that business to take a chance on this environment that I have to be willing as a government to give them some type of break or incentive to come to the community. Yeah. And so that might be um, waiving certain permitting fees. You know, if we have a city-owned property, maybe um, going into some type of agreement where they're paying reduced rent so they can just recover the cost of startup and things like that. Indeed. So we have to be, and that's just from a, a from so that you can modify some things to. Oh yeah, make we, it we definitely can. You know, um, we yeah. just um, our Clayton County Economic Development. They just um, they had a, a loan program where businesses could get $75,000 in facade grants. Mm. Well, we, our council decided if you get the facade grant, then we are going to waive all the building and permitting fees for anything associated with that grant. Because if you're going to get $75,000 in grants, I want you to spend every dime of that money doing what you need to do to rehab your business. I don't yeah. want a dime of that coming to business because it's going to make our city look better. Yeah. So we waived all of that. Yeah. So we got to be really creative with our private-public partnership. Now, there's some other different levels that you can get, like private-public financing and things like that. But just on the yeah. basic level of what the citizens want and what would improve just Jonesboro in general, yeah. it's going to take a lot of flexibility. And we're going to have to give some to yeah. get what we want because Indeed. I understand everyone wants to make money. That's what businesses are for. You know, they're for a profit. But we have to think of how we can um, compromise and be, and be business friendly. And, and I think we're doing that. Good deal. And any local endorsements? Anybody that's running that you support? And that oh, you now, see now, you're, now you're just being real, man. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I definitely, I'm endorsing my boy Eric Bell, <laughs> State <laughs> District. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, and I will tell you, I mean, he, he's, he's a native Clayton County. Um, yeah. I've been super proud of him. You yeah. know, uh, I want to put him back in the house. Yeah. Um, I, I, it's, it's a, he's a different general, you know, he's, he's, we ain't in the same cohort. Yeah. Um, so when people say, you know, these younger politicians, I'm like, what yeah. about them? <laughs> they yeah. doing things, yeah. you know? And yeah. so, uh, Eric, I'm proud of you. So yeah. if you have the opportunity to vote for Eric Bell, yeah. Um, make sure. So that's going to be the only endorsement I'm going to get tonight. Okay. <laughs> Stay safe. I might endorse somebody in Florida, but I ain't, he's not about to get me in trouble up in here. Hey, what about the presidential? Who you endorsing? <laughs> All right. Y'all know what it is. It's politics of black families. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. No, thank you. Thank you. Y'all just get out to vote. Thank vote for the right person, but I'm just right. saying. Right. <laughs> Y'all get out and vote. You can't vote for is. Biden this time. You can stay home. <laughs> Everybody else vote. But if you can't vote for Biden, just stay. We don't even need to vote. Don't even exactly. worry about it. Y'all know what it is. Thanks for joining us. Peace. <laughs>